This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to my streaming video service Nebula when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. So the 2022 season has basically begun now with all the new cars unveiled and with a full three days testing behind them, even if some teams days were less full than others. And now we've actually got to see a bunch of the design choices from the teams, understand a little bit about their approach to the new rules and see cars out on track, it's a good time to go through some of the main common talking points, bits of jargon and general things you'll be hearing about the new cars through the season. Yes, including porpoising. But let's start with why there's a whole raft of technical changes for this season. Well, F1 wants to improve car-on-car -car action and let drivers race closer without being hampered by dirty air. Previously, teams exploited every avenue of bodywork they could to create vortices right down the car from the tips of the winglets and end plates to the many, many turning vanes and barge boards seen down the middle of the cars. This ejected horrible, messy, dirty air into the airstream behind them, causing any car following in that wake to suffer horrible understeer and fall back through the medium to high speed corners. The cars need front downforce so the front of the car can bite, steer into the corner effectively and lead the line through the corner. If that front downforce is hampered by dirty air, the car isn't able to turn in properly and hold its speed through the corner. So gone are all these bargeboardy bits in the middle for a start. The wings now form a solid continuous shape that flows into what used to be end plates. At the front they join directly onto the nose so there are no winglet tips to generate vortices. The DRS is now Hideous. But the less spoken about that, the better. The wheels now have covers on the outside and fins on the inside to clean up some of the mess in the air they generate when they spin at high speeds. There's a whole other video on that. But the biggest difference is the shift to what we're calling ground effect. There is debate among purists over whether this is true ground effect, but for the purposes of understanding what's going on, and because that's what we're all calling it, let's be honest, that's the term we'll use. So. F1 cars want to generate a lot of downforce. That's using the moving air to push the car down so the tyres can grip the road more effectively and hold the car to the road through the high speed corners. Now, for the last many a year we focused a lot on overbody downforce. That is, using the air over the top part of the car to generate downforce by using the front and rear wings for the most part. But you can also generate air from underneath the car. And in fact, yeah, teams have been doing that for years too, but in a more restricted way using the diffuser. The cars previously had flat bottoms up to a point, and now the cars are allowed sculpted three-dimensional floors that channel airflow through Venturi tunnels. Okay, so how does this generate downforce? Well, these tunnels have a large mouth drawing in air at the front, and they also have a large opening at the exit where the air escapes again. But underneath the car, the space in which the air can flow is shrunk dramatically by bringing the floor surface incredibly close to the ground. So, at the front of the Venturi tunnel you've got a large mass of air moving at the speed of normal airflow. And at the back, you've also got a large mass of air moving at the speed of normal airflow. But these two airflows are connected, unbroken through this narrow tunnel, and the only way all of this air can get through this small space at the same rate is to accelerate. So the airflow speed underneath the car is much faster than the airflow speed over and around the car, which means that it's a much lower pressure and low pressure areas create suction. So this fast moving air under the car pulls the car down and that is ground effect downforce. And the advantage of underfloor downforce is it's less susceptible to disturbed air than overbody downforce is. So hopefully this too makes for racier racing. Now at the rear of the car we've got beam wings returning, these things here, and in combination with the big diffusers and these rear wheel flick ups, these designs will hopefully throw the airflow higher and more out of the way of the following traffic. And we are actually seeing a lot of design variation in this area. But the big question is, will it work? Is it working? After all, drivers have tried it now. And so far the answer seems to be that driving behind another car is markedly improved, with some reservation drivers have noticed a difference. Now while Verstappen has said there are still some understeer oversteer problems in following, he said there's not a big drop in downforce anymore. And the Claire Science Alvin Schumacher have reported that it does seem noticeably easier to drive in the wake of another car. So that's good, that's hopeful isn't it? 
Now, one thing to keep an eye on is the front wing is still being asked to do a lot of work at the front of the car, so we can't get complacent yet. Think about it like this, the downforce across the length of the car is biased a bit rearwards, with the front wing working to balance the aero load generated at the back. However, the downforce work at the rear of the car is split between the rear wing and the diffuser, whereas at the front, the vast majority of the downforce comes from the front wing alone. So if the front wing efficacy is compromised by dirty air, you will immediately get hit by understeer in ways the underfloor cannot save. So just something to keep an eye on. Now a noticeable change in the way cars are designed and set up now is the stiffness of the suspension. Previously, with the flat floors, teams would elevate their rear end to exaggerate the performance of the diffuser, a tilting known as rake. This year though, the cars are planted firmly to the ground and that's what you need to get these ground effect floors working. And in order to hold them stable and low, the suspension has been stiffened up so there's less give in the way the car body moves relative to the wheels. The knock-on effect of this is, while the cars are noticeably faster in the high-speed corners thanks to ground effect, they are much more awkward and slow in the slow corners because they lack the compliant suspension that allows the cars more roll. This also means they'll be much worse over the bumps and the curbs and teams have been avoiding them in testing so far, not risking damaging the floors of the cars or, as a second thought, their driver's spines. But something that has been shaking the drivers up is the new buzzword of 2022, porpoising. A porpoise is an animal like a dolphin. Now, everyone knows what a dolphin is, but porpoises are a little more obscure, so I don't know why porpoising has long winged the expression over dolphin ning Okay, I kind of see. Anyway, you know how dolphins move across the surface of the sea, up and down, up and down, with grace, style and smugness? So it is here with F1 and these new floors. At high speed, the rear end starts to bounce up and down on its haunches. A pain on the driver, opening potential for damaging the floor and possibly causing handling issues at high speeds. So what is it? And why does it occur? Well, you remember how the fast moving air under the floor causes a suction that pulls the whole car down towards the ground? Well, if you go fast enough, you may end up bringing the floor so close to the track that you choke out the underfloor airflow. And if that fast airflow stops, the downforce, the suction, stops. And the car suspension springs the car back up to full height again. But this reintroduces airflow under the car, sucking it back down again. And when it gets sucked down, it chokes its own airflow again, loses downforce, springs back up, and so on, in a cycle of bouncy bad times. Now, this can most likely be sorted out. I suspect we'll see a number of solutions in the final test at Bahrain. Obviously raising the car up would help, but teams want that juicy, juicy low floor downforce. So maybe they'll cleverly work the suspension to handle it, or shape the floor to allow the air to flow without stalling at tight compression. But there remains a chance we'll see porpoising show itself throughout the season to some degree. It all depends on what the teams are happy to tolerate. Right, so what else are we going to hear about this year? Weight. The cars are up quite staggering 43 kilograms heavier this year, up to a 795 kilogram minimum weight. Now this is a result of some improved safety systems and the much bigger wheels. Heavier cars are less nimble and harder to handle in the slow corners, which compounds the stiff suspension problem. What's extra interesting this year is that a few teams have struggled to get their cars down to the minimum weight. Typically, cars are built underweight and then heavy ballast is placed strategically to bring the cars up to the required minimum. But this year, some teams, including Red Bull, are starting overweight. Now, luckily, this won't result in drivers starving themselves, as in previous years, as the driver on the seat must meet their own minimum weight. But still, these cars are some hefty lads. The last thing I want to touch on, really, are all these different shaped side pods and rear ends we're seeing. It's been genuinely fun and a relief to see that teams have gone in a few directions under these new rules. When the side pod and engine cover shapes are all about airflow and cooling solutions. So the teams want a nice, heavy, clean flow of air out the back of the overbody of the car. This is the airflow that the diffuser air will meet and connect with, so we want it to be a big, heavy, mass of clean, fast-flowing air that will help suck as much air as possible through the car underbody. Some teams have wide, elbows-out side pods which hope to nudge the messy tyre wake away from this clean flow. Some, like Mercedes, have gone narrow with the idea that the body will be far enough away from the tyre wake that it won't attach to the side pod at all. Some of the teams, like Red Bull, are sending the airflow over the top of their side pods, down washing it into the gap between the rear wheels. In these cases, the side pod remains quite wide at the rear. Some of the teams, like the Ferrari, have undercuts at the rear of the side pod, driving the airflow around the side and over the diffuser. 
On some cars, you'll see cooling louvres or gills down the engine covers to let hot air escape. Now, you don't really want hot air sent into your main airflow, so you'll tend to see gills more on cars that use the side body flow than the more downwashy, short side potted teams. These teams are more likely to open up this gap at the rear of the car to let their hot air out into the world. So we are seeing a decent amount of variation. There is an expectation that these different designs will converge into whatever is concluded to be the best package for this rule set a bit over this season and then more so over the next few years. But perhaps these many solutions will all continue to be fast and relevant and we will see different looking cars for seasons to come. Wouldn't that be something? As mentioned, this video is brought to you by Curiosity Stream and Nebula. If you continue to be curious and interested in many a thing, then I've got a deal for you. Nebula is a streamy award nominated platform where I and a bunch of other fascinating independent creators have got together to showcase our work away from YouTube, away from ads and sponsor reads and work with some of the elbow room that algorithmically driven platforms don't give us. There are creators making super interesting videos with specialisms in everything from science and tech to current events to movies and gaming. So perhaps if you want decent well-crafted explainers on what's going on in the news right now, TLDR makes videos that will break it all down for you. And if you're into gaming and you want to know how games are made from the balancing of the rules to the mechanics of the gameplay, then the wonderful Game Makers Toolkit will be right up your alley. Now, while Nebula is chock full of us indie creators, Curiosity Stream is a full blown, big budget documentary powerhouse, showcasing thousands of non fiction titles in subjects across the globe and beyond. So you can settle in to watch films or series on any topic that interests you or dive into Curiosity Stream's Crash Course series to get you up to speed on dozens of subjects. And because Curiosity Stream and Nebula fit so well together, you can get both as a package. And it works like this. If you subscribe to Curiosity Stream, you will get access to Nebula completely free for as long as you're a Curiosity Stream subscriber. And if you sign up via my link in the description, curiositystream.com slash chainbear, you'll get 26% off the annual plan, which works out to just $14.79 for the whole year. I mean, that is a lot of content for so few coins. And you'll be helping out us creators too. So go check it out. 